All right, Shannon, what up? How are we doing tonight? Doing good. How about yourself? We are blessed. We're glad that you carved out some time for us. We're happy to have you and be able to tell your story. You know, um, obviously, before we get into soccer and LSU and, and you know, you growing up, we got to talk, you and I. I'm a traveler. I've been to a lot of places. But from your Instagram, we did some digging. Paris, <laughs> Greece, Vegas. I mean, you're you're getting all over the place. What is the your most favorite place that you've traveled? Well, that's a good one. If it uh, ain't it, if it ain't Greece, I don't know you. You know what? It is gonna be Greece, and not just because you said that. It can't be Vegas because I lost a lot of money there. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna have to go with Greece. Where uh, <laughs> where at in Greece did you go? And um, we went to Zakynthos. Oh, okay. So I you love that about that one. It's it's nothing like Santorini. We went for a bit more low key rather than the bougie side. I got gotcha. you. I I've done the party side in Mykonos and the bougie side in Santorini, and I think Santorini is probably the greatest place on earth. Yeah, I I definitely got that place on my bucket list. Maybe later okay. in life. Yeah, you got to If you go, you got to do that next time though. Deal. That's gonna be that's gonna be booked for sure. All right. Well, you know, I don't I got to go back to Vegas, though. Obviously, you said you lost too much money. It, mm -hmm. it, what's your go to game? What, what What are you losing money on? Come on now. Well, I love a bit of roulette and I'm used to roulette. That's like three dollars, five dollars a spin. So I was like, OK, yeah, it's not going to be any different in Vegas. So I slapped down fifty dollars on the table. I'm thinking yeah, it should last me about 30 minutes. That's normally the huge. Two spins later, I'm gone. I was like to the, the dealer, whatever you call him, what's going on? They were like, yeah, it's $25 a hand. I was like, wow, that is the quickest 50 bucks I've ever lost in my life. <laughs> well, <laughs> now that we've talked about traveling and losing money, I've definitely lost some money, but I haven't traveled. I've never been outside of the United States, so I can't, I can't relate to what your favorite thing is. I got to look all this stuff up that y'all just said. When, when Daniel got married, he went on this crazy honeymoon, right? And posted all these pictures. I thought about blocking him, Shannon. I really did. I'm like, look at this guy all cultured, showing us where he's been. You're jealous. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely <laughs> jealous. Take jealous. Me next time, Dan. Yeah, take me with you. I mean, geez. I mean, y'all got, y'all had been together for like well, 40 years. Well, Randy, you, you can't tell her to take you with you. You got to tell her that you have like 17 kids that you have to bring along too. No, I'm not bringing any kids. There's <laughs> no. the cash. Yeah, no, there's no catch. That was my second wife that got that catch, Shannon. You're safe. It's all good. I don't even like the kids anymore. But speaking of places I've never been, obviously we're doing a little bit of research going into the show. For those that don't know, obviously they can hear it. Where are you from? Um, so I'm obviously from England. I tell people London just because it's really broad and everyone knows London. But diving deep into that, I'm actually from a little town called Croxley Green. So it's just outside of London, but nobody's heard of Coxley Green. So normally I just tell people London. It just saves a lot of questions in conversation. <laughs> well, we're here for the questions and conversation. <laughs> so describe it for us. What's it, what's the when, when you tell people where you actually are from, what do you say? I tell them if if they know the area, I tell them Coxley Green. Um, it's not city, but it's also not completely country. It's quite, kind of like the suburbs. Like you can walk around the corner for a bottle of milk, whereas if you lived in the country, you'd have to drive 30 minutes to get to get to your closest shop. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of greenery, a lot of trees, a lot of fields. Obviously, grew up playing in the fields there, so I was lucky I didn't grow up in the in central where there's a lot of cages and concrete. I was blessed I could actually play on a grass field, which was nice. Um, it's not too busy, but a lot of people know each other, so it's a nice little town. No, it sounds sounds lovely. So speaking of that nice little town, get in the, the family dynamics. I mean, where we, we got obviously brothers and sisters, mom, dad. What was it like growing up? Yeah, so I grew up obviously with my mom and my dad, Mandy and Jim, and my older brother, Aaron. Um, my brother is a almost professional. We're working on it at the moment. Um, racing driver. He is absolutely phenomenal at what he does. He is three times British champion, three times European champion, two times Scottish champion, international champion. He's absolutely phenomenal. Um, so actually, as we speak, we're on, on the hunt to get him some sponsorship because he wants to look to go into the next formula. Um, so growing up, very, very athletic in our household and always used to play out in the yard with my brother. 
you know, when you said like almost professional, I thought you were going to say like he's won a few races and then you just his resume. That's incredible. And we're talking yeah, he, multi-time he's champion. <laughs> I'm not just a bias sister. He's got the accolades to prove it. Wait, so are you saying that like who's you a better athlete than your brother, though? Oh, when it comes to our feet, I would say for sure. But on hands on a steering wheel, I think he's got me in that one. <laughs> Now I got to ask you, cause I mean, I, I, we have a couple of formula one races. I've worked a bunch of them. Is your brother, is he as tall as you? You're five ten. for those that don't know. Yes. Yeah, he is actually. So funny story. Um, when we were younger, obviously you're predicted a specific height. Um, and I was ironically predicted five foot six and he was predicted six foot two and we're both five foot 10. So I always tell him that I stole his four. <laughs> you took the four inches. Yeah. <laughs> we evened it out. I got you. So mom, dad, are they athletes as well? Um, no, mom's five foot three and a half. And she often jokes and she says, like, I don't know how you came out of me because <laughs> she's honestly tiny. Like she's so petite. And dad, he claims he's six foot, but I think he's shrunk a couple of inches as he's got an old. I always tease him about that. Um, but no, my dad, he, he grew up being a motocross racer as well. So that's that's what kind of runs in the family. I understand. So at, at what age do you start playing soccer? Soccer, I started age nine. So I was a bit okay. of a late bloomer. De yeah, definitely. Usually, sometimes you hear before that. I mean, was it the only sport you played growing up? Was it the first sport you played growing up? No, I actually tried a lot of things because we obviously had sports day back at, back at home once a year. And I just, I literally lived for sports day and we'd have sports week as well. And that was my favorite day and favorite week of the whole term and the whole year. And I was always winning sports day. And the parents used to say to my mum and dad, you have to get her into something athletic because it's going to be so wasted. Um, so mum and dad, they, they said, look, Shan, what do you want to do? And I wasn't really sure. So we got some leaflets from the school, just giving us some ideas. Um, I went to cross country and I was just lapping people. And I was like, this is so boring. <laughs> so the next week, mum and dad took me to tennis. Um, and they were just playing these silly little games where you had to like try and hit cones. And I was like, this is so boring. I want to rally people. I want to actually play the game of tennis. Uh, so that didn't last very long. I did netball. I tried rugby. Um, and then I just started kind of playing football or soccer in the, in the playground with the boys in the, in the garden with my brother. And then when I was nine, like I say, a leaflet actually came out from the school saying that there was a local girls team starting up. Um, so I took the letter home in my book bag and I said to mum and dad, oh, I think this looks really fun. I want to give it a try. And they were like, yeah, absolutely. When does it start? So it started that Saturday. So they took me along. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I didn't even have any cleats. I was wearing my older brother's cleats. And you can imagine these were huge because he was four years older than me. Um, but mum and dad didn't want to buy me a pair of cleats because they were like, oh, she's probably only going to last two weeks and then get bored and want to try something else. So they didn't want to buy me a hundred dollar pair of cleats for it to last a couple of weeks. So I go to this um, this training session and I had fun. So I went back the next week and it was fun. So three weeks in, we had a tournament, like a local tournament where all the teams came and we got absolutely annihilated. I think we lost like, every game 10-0, 9-0. We, we was trash, but I had a great time. And the next day, my mum, um, she got a phone call from a Watford scout. So that's a local team near me. I'm not sure if you're aware of the Premier League, the team Watford. Mm -hmm. So um, a Watford scout called my mum and said, oh, we saw your daughter at the tournament. We'd love her to come along and trial. My mum said, oh, is this some sort of joke? Like, is this a prank call? And they were like, no, no, we actually, we saw her. And mum thought it was funny because obviously we got annihilated in this tournament. And the guy said, no, we see something in her. We'd love her to come along. So I come home after school and mum was like, oh, I had a phone call today, Shan. And I was like, oh, what was that about? And she said, yeah, you've been invited to a trial to Watford. And I was like, what for like the football team, Watford? And she was like, yeah. She goes, do you want to go? And I was like, yeah, I might as well. It's another opportunity to play football. I might as well go along. So mum and dad took me and it literally was like a fate going on. There was hundreds and hundreds of girls. And we said, are we at the right place? Because at that, at that point, it was 2009, we wasn't even aware of that girls really played football because I was so new to the scene. Um, so we were like really confused. Anyway, I, I carried on playing. Um, I was in the in the trial and I remember this like it was yesterday. We all got a number stuck to our chest just so they could identify who we were. And in the middle of this drill, I went running up to my mum and dad crying. And they were like, what's the matter? And I said, oh, my number keeps falling off. They're not going to know who I am. And they were like, it's fine. Just try and stick it back on. They know who you are. Don't worry about it. So I carried on. 
got a phone call the next the next time to come back to the next trial. And we're like, wow, no way, I actually got through the next one. So at this point it's trial two of three. Um, and you obviously keep getting called back to the next one. So I go to the next one and there's less girls. Um, and I was having a conversation, bearing in mind I'm nine at this point with some of the other girls. And they were like, oh, how long have you been playing? We've been playing for three years. Yeah, three weeks. Yeah, and I was like, oh, three weeks. And they literally looked at me and was like, oh, good luck. We've been here every year and still not got in. I was like, well, this is brilliant. Like, I'm never going to get in now if I've been playing for three weeks. I'm still wearing my brother's cleats. <laughs> I'm just looking like an amateur. So anyway, I just play, have a bit of fun at the trial, and I get called back to the final. I was like, wow. And mum and dad were like, this is amazing, because in the car on the way home, I was like, I'm not getting called back. These girls have been here for years. I've literally been playing for three weeks. Mum and dad were like, you don't know that. You tried your best. You did really well. Just you've got to be think positive. Got to call back, go back to the final. And I mean, they must have saw something in me because I got a call about a week later and and mum actually came into school to tell me and we just both burst into tears because we couldn't believe I'd actually done it because I was so so new to the game. And I mean, that's where everything started. I finally got my new pair of cleats that were my own. Didn't have finally them. earned some. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, that's where my story began with soccer. Randy, let me ask you something. You know, you know, you coach sports. Daniel, you coach sports. Uh, I don't know if y'all remember. Uh, Shannon, my daughter, that's actually how she ended up getting picked up by her club team. They were getting beat 16 to 1, absolutely drubbed. And uh, the coach came and approached her afterward because uh, he said it was 16 to 1, but you would have thought it was 1 to 1 because she was the hardest playing player on the field. And he said, I can't teach that. Gave her a tryout. She made the team. And so both you guys know um, it's – Something about you can see more about a player when they're losing than you can if they're winning. And no, so that, they probably saw that with you, Shannon. They probably said 10 nothing, and this girl's still just out there giving everything she's got. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. So that's a that's a quick start there, Shannon. So you're you're nine, you play, you're getting beat 10 nothing in your first tournament, and all of a sudden now you're making a, a club team. So obviously you played for them for a while. When you so what what high school did you attend when you got there? Yeah, I went to Rickmansworth School. So when I was nine, I don't know, the schools kind of are different back home. Um, I would have still been in what you guys call elementary school until I was 12. I'm not sure if the ages are the same. Yes, yeah, similar. And then when I was in, um, so when I went into high school, I was actually in a different club. Oh, okay. So, I mean, how long, did, I gotta, I'm got i going to go back for just a second. So you make the club team. And when you start playing on that team, how long did it take you to feel like you belonged or did you feel like that from the beginning? Oh, that's a great question. Um, honest answer, I can't really remember exactly how I was feeling at that time because obviously it was yeah. 13 years ago. Um, I remember little instances here and there, um, little things that would happen and, and things like that. But no, I definitely felt welcomed on the team. I can't remember a time where I ever would go home and, and not want to play football anymore. I mean, I loved every single second of it. Um, so, yeah, I think I probably did just jump and fit right in. And being nine years old is probably quite easy to make friends. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Those no ones at the trials. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no doubt. So uh, you, you're going to Rickmansworth, talking a little bit about that. Uh, just kind of looking at it. Talk to me about the academic standards at that school. Yeah, they were good. Um, I think it's a very different level of education back home in England compared to out here in the States. Um, so the first couple of years back home for the first four years you just do all these subjects and then the last year you take all these exams on those subjects and then for the last two years after that you get to specialize in three um, and I went to a good school it wasn't a private school or anything but private schools aren't very common back home I know they are quite common out here in the states but it was a public school and yeah I had a great experience I definitely wouldn't change my time there. Yeah, so no doubt. So back, obviously, you know, here, uh, high school soccer is a big thing. Is, is club soccer is too. But obviously, we call it a football. It's not as big here as it is overseas, maybe. But uh, is in England, is high school soccer a thing, or is it club soccer over there? Yeah, no, high school is not a thing at all. That's the, again a huge reason I decided to come out here, just because the opportunity in sports on anything other than like the club level and the professional level back home just don't don't really exist like um, I know some of the girls here they played for high school and they were national champions which is amazing um, but no back home I was one of the few girls that even played a sport there was a couple of us that played football but 
it was just more for a bit of fun. Like we would win 10-0 in, in the high school games just because the other teams had nobody that would play. So the high school was more so just to get the girls running around and enjoying PE as a sense rather than a commitment like it is out here for high school. So obviously club is where it's at and, you know, you are a part of the Arsenal U20, the England U18 squads. You had 18 career caps for England uh, for their junior team. I got to ask, and they picked me to go through this part of the, the interview with you because I'm not really like well-versed in soccer. So <laughs> you're going to educate me on a lot of things as you and I talk through this next you know, segment. What is a cap? We got to start there. So a cap is, it's not a physical cap. It's every time you represent your country. So I've actually got 24. So I've played 24 times for the youth team. Um, and then each time, if you go to a tournament, you might actually get an actual cap, which is kind of an old fashioned, it doesn't look like a bucket hat. It's more of like, um, like a flat cap. And it's velvet material and it's engraved with the different games that you would play on it. So I've got a couple of them back home from tournaments in cabinets back home in boxes. It's more of like a trophy trophy than something you'd wear. So when you came here and people were saying cap and no cap, was was that uh, throwing you off a little bit? Yeah, I was like, do you want me to whip my England cap out? What are you talking about? <laughs> No, so you, you helped England take the top spot in their elite round group qualifying uh, stage to advance to the 2017 UEFA Women's U17 Championship. That was in the Czech Republic. So you're getting to travel not just in England, but you're, you're going all over the place with this. Um, yeah. You know, what is that experience like? Are you with your family? Are they doing this with you? Or are you like, rolling solo just learning becoming an adult like you know every day you've done a lot of research i'm impressed you know more bit. about my journey than i do <laughs> no so my mum and dad actually they're obviously allowed to travel and watch because when we would when we would play for the national team we'd go all around europe um as in a sense and mum and dad were one of the few parents who would they never missed a game i'm so lucky to have the parents that i do they're so supportive they would literally fly even if it was for a day and a night just to make sure that they didn't miss me play but in terms of national camp they weren't allowed in into the national camp there might be an hour here and there throughout a week's camp that we could pop and see them but we couldn't just go and freely hang out with them and do what we want it was a very professional strict environment where if you was on national camp you were with the team 99 percent of the time gotcha so pretty serious pretty regimented but you played four seasons with the arsenal u20 club and you led them to the fa cup title in 2016 um you know seems like you know you're playing really young at some of the big stages how much did you learn from each of these stages and how much confidence did it give you when you ultimately moved out of that were you super confident or were you still fearful that you know do I have what it takes to compete? Yeah, I think each experience that I've been through, regardless of the level that it's at, I think each experience you can take little bits of confidence from that um, and just knowledge knowledge about the game and different experience on how to act in different situations. Because ultimately, when you step on the field, you don't know what you're going to face until, until you face it. But I think just these experiences I've had and been lucky enough to have growing up, playing in front of big crowds, playing for huge titles and having a lot on the line. It's, yeah, it's definitely fueled me with a lot of confidence. And then when I came out to the States, just knowing I am capable of doing this because of the things that I've faced prior to coming out here. So it's, it's safe to say we know why LSU reached out to you, but when did they start reaching out to you? Yeah, they reached out to me in... December 2017, and then I was out here in the July 2018. And, and so what was the big reason why you were like, all right, yeah, that's where I want to go? Obviously, to me, it seems like with the resume that you're bringing, you could have played at a lot of places. So why LSU? I wasn't actually looking to come out to America. So the stage of my life that I was in at that time, I was 18 years old. 
well, 17 actually, when I was when I was contacted, but 18 when I came out here. Um, and I was playing for Arsenal at the time, the under 20s, and I was breaking through into the first team. So I was training with the first team full time, missing school because of that, and just being a full time training player with the first team. And I also travelled with them as well. And I'd be lucky to get five minutes at the end of the game here and there because obviously I was 17 and just so happy to be there. Um, they weren't going to look to put me in as a centre back when they've got these phenomenal internationals that they're paying thousands to be there. Um, and then obviously I had a chat with the coach at, back at Arsenal and I said, look, I've been given this amazing opportunity. What what do you recommend? And it was actually Joe Montemaro at the time who was the manager. And I owe him a lot for his honesty because he said to me, Shan, this is such an amazing opportunity. I can't promise you game time here because you're so young. We've got some internationals coming in. It wouldn't be fair for me to promise you game time. Like I'm not saying you wouldn't get any, but I can't promise that you will because obviously things change. People come, go, injuries, of course. And he said, I think you should do it. This is amazing. This club's always going to be here, but this opportunity to go out to the States isn't. And I'm so glad he didn't just keep me around as a training player just for his benefit. He, he really wanted the best for me and he wanted me to come out here and do this and achieve this. Um, so I'm really grateful for his honesty. And then when I did come out here and I saw the facilities, I was like, wow, this place is, this is something else. And it's definitely not something I could do in England. So obviously you, you hop on a plane, you, you fly across the pond, you, you're headed into Baton Rouge, which, I mean, we can all, we can all attest to this. Like that's totally different as far as on the spectrum of, of what to ex expect. Um, what is the culture shock like leaving England and going to Baton Rouge? And what is the biggest difference that you see between home and Baton Rouge? I think the first obvious one would obviously be the heat. The humidity <laughs> out here is absolutely insane. Um, my first week here, I'm a fit player, like I can run and run and run. But my first week of training, I really struggled because I just felt like I was breathing through a snorkel. I was like, what is this? I said to Megan Johnson, she's obviously from Baton Rouge, and I said to her, is this normal or does it get cooler? And she said, no, Shan, this is normal. And I said, how do you how do you deal with this? How do you get used to this? And she said, you don't get used to it. You just teach yourself to deal with it. And she couldn't have been more right because I still step outside and I'm sweating. But I'm just, that's what I expect now. and I'm just used to that. And then in terms of culture, I think Southern hospitality is definitely is definitely a real thing. I'll, I'll go to Walmart and make a friend and then invite me over for dinner. <laughs> Whereas back home in England, that would be so strange and you would be considered a weirdo if you was to invite someone to dinner who you'd never met. But out here, that's just so normal. And How long did it take you to get used to that, though? Did you look at them like they were weirdos? <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe I still do. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I've ever taken anyone up on that opportunity. <laughs> just so we're clear. Sometimes those people are still weirdos, even in the South. <laughs> yeah. Just stay clear of them just in case. <laughs> just in case. So obviously, you know, you you get over there, you get over this culture shock, you know, pretty quickly. You have an immediate impact your freshman year. You're a part of, you know, a stud defensive back line. Um, you know, you made a run in the S at the SEC title, you made a run in the NCAA tournament. You had huge goals against Tennessee and Arkansas. Did you personally expect to have this much success coming in as a freshman, um, especially being named in the All-SEC Tournament as a freshman? No, I definitely wouldn't have said that I expected that. Um, I don't think I necessarily came into this with expectations of myself. I more so just came into this with the mindset of work hard, get better every day. And I'm a big believer that you, you really get out of things what you put in. And I really grinded and worked hard to, to earn my spot as a freshman because obviously I know that's not, not something that's given away easily coming here, um, being foreign and just starting and being a freshman and being so young. Um, but yeah, I didn't, didn't put too much pressure on myself. I just worked hard every day and, and just reaped the benefits, luckily. So, you know, as far as, you know, you know, that's personal, but as far as, you know, the team success, you win the SEC tournament, you make it to the second round of the NCAA tournament. Um, you know, what is it like to be a part of, you know, in your first year making a big impact? What is it like being a part of a team where you're like, man, the foundation of this team is, is great. And like, 
the sky is really the limit for what we can accomplish here. Yeah, it was amazing. It was it was definitely motivating to know that if we've done this, we can keep pushing and going further. And I think the having that away from home, almost having a family away from home is definitely something that made me enjoy this experience 10 times more than I would have if we was just a group of individuals all on completely different paths and had completely different goals. So, yeah, I think us being such a well-bonded team is obviously what led to our success, but also something that just made us enjoy what we was doing each and every day. You know, obviously, you know, you after that first year, you, you know, we talk about having a foundation and the success is there and the sky is the limit. But obviously you go into the next season and, and you guys kind of take a step backwards. What changed? What was different about that second season where, you know, you weren't able to generate and keep the momentum going from the first year? I think a huge thing that made us so successful in the first year was just the belief that we had in not only each other and the coaches, but also ourselves. And obviously losing Brian Lee as the head coach was a huge loss for the programme because he'd been here for so long. Um, and then we got an interim coach and everything was a little bit up in the air because people didn't know if they were coming or going. We didn't know if this was permanent or just temporary. And I think it might have affected a lot of mindset within the team. And I think mindset is obviously such a huge thing, especially in a team, because if there's a handful of people who who maybe don't believe or are kind of over what's going on right now, it affects all 32, not just those handful that maybe feel a bit lost or a bit confused in what's going on in the moment. Yeah, so no doubt you talk about the coach leaving and then you have the interim, but Coach Hudson comes in and gets hired after that in the 2019 season. And just, you know, with her resume, how excited were y'all for her to be coming in? Yeah, extremely excited. And personally, I was very excited because obviously she was – she was from near where I was from, so um, the United Kingdom. But I think as a team, once we read her resume, we was like, wow, she's going to do great things for the programme. And again, like I said, straight away, just looking at her resume, it instilled that belief and that mindset, again, that we can do this. And she came in and she obviously brought in her coaching staff and, and had Seb as well, who was also British, which was lovely for us, us foreigners, having a bit of home away from home. And they're just still in the European style of play. And she made it very clear from the get-go, her values, what she wanted, what the goals for this programme were. And she's stuck to each and every one of them. And I think the programme, since she's she's got here, her and Seb and the rest of the staff, I think it's just continued to go on an upward path. And I think this season as well, we're really going to see that. Yeah, and y'all had some obstacles out the gate with uh, with Coach Hudson and the fact that y'all had to deal with COVID, you know, um, a lot of cancellations, um, you know, and so it's it's hard when you're starting to, uh, you know, build this chemistry and then you have all those different things. You have, uh, you know, the season change on you. But ultimately, you know, after a lot of close losses, because um, we went to a lot of those games, we watched a lot of your games, um, you know, y'all put together some big wins in the SEC tournament, um, you know, beating Alabama, beating Ole Miss, losing a close one to Texas A&M. So clearly, you know, y'all just had to be able to get that time to build that chemistry under Coach Hudson. And obviously COVID kind of, you know, put that uh, on the back burner a little bit. But once y'all got going and started getting it together, just how good did that feel? Yeah, it felt great. Um, obviously, we worked really hard to be where we was at and the results didn't necessarily show that in the early stages of when Sean got here. But we never let that defeat us. And Seb always says, you never lose, you just learn. And I think that's a huge quote because we learned so much from each and every game from not only mentality standpoint, but technical, tactical, physical, we needed we needed to know what we needed to do to be where we needed to be at. And those losses definitely, definitely kicked us at the butt in needing to know what, what we needed to do to be successful. And then Sean basically said to us when we got to the SEC, this is the final exam. And she, she couldn't have been more right. So everything we did in the lead up was the learning, the practice tests, and this was the final exam, and it's a shame we obviously fell short to AM, but I think that tournament that year is when this team started to get into its stride. And then obviously we had a great spring going off of that, and I think the SEC that year that you're speaking about is when that all started to kickstart and it all started to fall into place. 
Yeah, absolutely. Because then the next season, y'all just come out on fire. Um, you know, I uh, can't remember how many wins y'all put together in a row. Um, and, you know, get all the way ranked up to number five. But, you know, I want to talk about, um, you know, that back line, you know, like I said, went to numerous games, watched a lot of games on the SEC network. Um, you and Maya Gordon just anchoring, anchoring in the center. Um, and, you know, it's funny, you used physicality and talked about being tactical. Um, you know, let me ask you a question, Shannon. And I watched it again a little bit last night in Mississippi State. Do you like inflicting pain? Be honest with me. <laughs> There's a right answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> I think by the laugh cold? we're gonna go with yes <laughs> because no, my, I, I do not like causing pain because my, my host Daniel doesn't believe that you're playing soccer unless you get yellow cards and you would absolutely be one of his favorite players because I have seen you get yellow cards and I've seen you take out girls so I think you do enjoy it <laughs> sometimes I think it's necessary it's not it's not to cause the pain but it's, it's a tactical decision tactical decision it's not it's not malicious Sometimes, yeah. every time. There was a play every last night, Daniel, just time. for an example. It doesn't even have to be necessarily laying the boom, which I've seen her do plenty. A girl was trying to get to the ball, and so she just decided she was going to completely shield her and, and put her body in the way and just take the blow, and it made the girl so mad, and then all the fans booed. And they wanted, like, a penalty, but that's actually a great defensive strategy. So she just, like, took the brunt of the hit and just – she didn't even move Shannon. Shannon didn't even budge, and so – how, but, you know, just for Daniel's, uh, you know, pleasure, Shannon, like if you were to just put like a, a guess, an estimate on how many yellow cards you've gotten in your college career, how many do you think you got? Well, it couldn't, it can't be more than 20 because I've never had to miss a game for too many yellows and you get five a year and then you have to sit. So it's definitely less than 20. I'm sitting on zero this year. Oh, um, I, we got to step well, that up. I'm going to say. Only, you only get five, five a year? I know, I've got to be a bit careful seems there. Low. That seems one, low. One year I was playing on the line at four, so I've had to rein it back a little bit. Ah, uh, see, that's the only reason, Daniel. She would have got the five, no problem, but she didn't want to be in trouble. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, if I had been challenged to the five, I definitely could have achieved that. I just got to be a bit careful. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, and it, it, it's fun. You, uh, you know, like I said, you and Maya both, y'all play with such a, a, a physicality on that back line. I, I love watching y'all, um, you know, in your defensive strategy. So ultimately last year, you know, y'all make it to the NCAA tournament and there is some major conflict. I, I know you see Daniel's Memphis flag behind him. Randy is in Memphis. Uh, we're all three from Memphis. Um, you know, we go to the, the local games. Memphis is the local team we support. But obviously, you know that you saw me and my daughter were LSU fans. So she even trains with Grace Storty from Memphis. So 64 teams last year in the tournament that can be paired up. And LSU and Memphis have to be paired of all teams. The two teams we root for to give us this conflict of interest. Um, it was great that y'all got to come to town and all, but like it made it, it made it really hard. And uh, you know, I wore purple and gold. My 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 daughter played the smart card. She went neutral. She was she wasn't uh -huh. <laughs> so, but, you know, <laughs> but you know, talk about, you know, since we are all from Memphis, talk about what it was like to come into Memphis because I know y'all got to spend some time around not just play soccer. Um, um just talk about that experience in Memphis and then also that game as well, and just getting, you know, back in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, I think a huge part of college soccer is getting to travel, which is obviously a huge blessing that we get to travel around the country and, and see all the different landmarks and see all these different states that you would never really go to unless unless you was playing soccer there. So getting to go to all these places is obviously really cool, but ultimately we are there for business trip and we're there to win the game, which obviously didn't happen um, in the Nationals, which is extremely frustrating. But I think that's something that we just need to continue to hold on to. It was still pretty fresh for me because I'm a terrible loser. So I hold stuff with me and use it as fuel. So I definitely haven't forgot about that game. And I'll be taking that in, into the NCAAs. I mean, this year, just holding a bit of grip between my teeth. Yeah, um, and you you basically kind of lost a national game there, Shannon. I don't know if you're familiar with Memphis's roster. It's more than half Canadian, so you know, you, you know, e England took a loss to Canada there. You know, what I'm I want to talk about that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it up. Uh, did you get to eat? Did you get to eat some Memphis barbecue while you were here? That's what we need to know. Yes, we did actually. We did. It got brought into the hotel one night, and I do love a bit of barbecue, so I definitely appreciate that. Where was it from? I couldn't tell you. It came in oh. on those metal trays, and I just dug in and enjoyed it. I bet you it was probably. I don't any questions. Were y'all staying downtown? 
You don't actually know. know. It's probably Rendezvous or Central, if I had to guess. It's good, though. It is good, though. There's, There's no bad good. barbecue here, Shannon, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> so, you know, um, you know, you talked about it was obviously, you know, you don't like losing. But would you say, especially coming off the previous, um, you know, two seasons, like I said, getting ranked all the way to number five in the nation and getting back to the NCAA tournament, would you, you know, say it was a successful season? I would, yes. I think we definitely started extremely successful making program history and going on a 10-game winning streak. That was that was amazing. But looking back, it's frustrating that we we went on that series of losing streaks because obviously you reap the highs, but then you also do suffer the lows. And unfortunately, that is part of the game. But something that I'm, st- I'm still learning to deal with, I, I ask any of my teammates, I am the worst loser in the world. I'm so competitive. I just love to win. So when we went on that five game losing streak, it's frustrating looking back because I question what could we have done to prevent that? And I, I honestly don't have the answer to that because during that time, we really dug deep as a team to try and find something that was going wrong that was leading to these losses. And then obviously we must have found something within us to, to beat Kentucky, which then took us back on that winning streak. But I do, I would conclude it a, uh, a successful season overall, especially with the start. Um, and then we finished we finished strong and then it was up and down. But if I was looking at the season, when I look back in years in years to come, I, I would classify that as, as a season where we did achieve a lot as a team. You know, I didn't have this question originally, but these guys know because I went on and on about it um, last season. Let me ask you a question. In those losses, um, I was there for this, unfortunately. Uh, was your least favourite loss possibly at Ole Miss – Yes. Probably. Probably. Hey, hey, you got to tell these guys about like, how bad how bad were the fans there? Just be honest. Be honest on here. Yeah, honestly, absolutely terrible. <laughs> One of the I, most smile environments I've ever been a part of. I, I try to tell these guys, and they're like, oh, you're just being, you know, you're an LSU guy, so you're just, you know, you're seeing all the negative. I'm like, no, this was this was different. This was special. So I just had to ask you that question. We'll we'll move on. We won't we won't harp too much on that. But you know, talking about getting to travel, um, you know, early this season, y'all got to go out to California and play some games. And I and I saw the pictures of uh, y'all having fun. Not only did y'all get to play some high caliber teams, but y'all got to have some fun. Uh, you know, just talk about that little trip to start this season. Yeah, that was so much fun. And I've always wanted to go to California and getting the chance to do that with, with the team and with people that I care so much about and get to the place at the same time. It's just a win-win. And we made such amazing memories on that trip. Funny story. It's probably going to sound disgusting, but let me let me give you some context so you don't judge it too, too early. I was trying to buy a boogie board off of a man on the beach who was, had this car and he was selling all this stuff. And he, he said, oh, um, the boogie board's $20. And I said to him, $20? That's a ripoff. Like, come on, give me a deal. And he wasn't having any of it. I said, listen, I'm on the LSU soccer team. I'll do a deal for you. I'll go up and down the beach promoting your car. And we're going to get everyone to buy something from you if you give me that boogie board for free. And I don't think he really understood what I was trying to offer him. But he was like, no, no, $20. And I was like, nah, I'm not having it. I'm not paying 20 bucks for an hour. So we're doing some activation on the beach. We're stretching, we're running, whatever. And I'm like to the girls, I really want a boogie board. So we're trying to eye out some kids in the ocean to see if we could share this boogie board with them. And we thought, now that's probably a little bit mean if 30 of us just go over there and try and take their boogie board. <laughs> and Alicia actually just so happened to look in this trash can and there was a brand new boogie board hardly touched and there wasn't any trash in there because otherwise I wouldn't have gone digging. But because I'm 5'10", I could just reach over there <laughs> and drag that bad boy out. So I went in there, I took to it out, I gave it a little wash in the ocean and we had so much fun. And honestly, that is something I'll never forget. We were just catching waves and just having the best time Shame. in there and memories for life. I got a whole other scenario here. You could have offered some Southern hospitality and dinner for that guy. I bet you could have got the boogie boy for free. I really don't think he was understanding what I was trying to say. I think the accent was really throwing him off. I, I just he's like, love, I don't know what you're saying, but no. Yeah, <laughs> he's like, no, give me the money. I just love the saying, one person's trash is another person's treasure came to life in, in this story. Absolutely. Absolutely. Treasure that made memories for life. I'll never, ever forget that. We actually kept that for the whole trip, which was so funny. And then at the end of the trip, I said to the the manager of the hotel here, you can have this, give this to a little kid. So it's still floating around in Cali somewhere. He's still living on. He might have thrown it in the trash, though. <laughs> he might have. Hopefully some kid goes digging. 
There you go. The gift that kept on giving. But, you know, uh, so y'all go have fun out there. You play some games and then you come back, um, you know, uh, get off to 2-0 and in the SEC, especially, uh, you know, I watched the game the other night. You know, you're down 1-0 with 18 minutes left. And, you know, and then all of a sudden y'all just – kick into high gear end up winning the game two to one just talk about that especially because um you had such a huge crowd at home at lsu you know first uh, sec game at home talk about what it was like to have that come back in front of that huge crowd yeah it was very special i think we owe a lot to the crowd because obviously they give us so much energy when maybe that's lacking on the field um but again it goes back to mindset not one of us on that team didn't think we would win and that was a big big talking point at halftime that we can do this. We can absolutely take this game and we can we can bring it to them. And obviously there was some clever tactical changes from the coaching staff and just continuing to believe in the team. And then when we got that first goal back, I think we were like, okay, yes, it's go time. We can absolutely do this. And then obviously we got the second one and just held back and killed the game a little bit and give the fans what they wanted to see. So let me ask you a question before I uh, talk to you about last night's game. Are you a superstitious person? See, that's a great question because I like to say no, but there are little silly things that I do. So it's probably yes. I asked Molly Swift last night, and I hadn't even told these guys this yet. Um, me and my daughter talked about it last night on the car ride home, but I'd asked Molly this. I, she was asking me if I was still coming to the Alabama game in Baton Rouge, and I said yes, but only if you will allow me because this is where I'm going to ask you if you believe in it. Y'all are 0 and 6 when me and my daughter have attended a game. Are we welcome to the Alabama game, Shannon? No. Oh dear, that is not a good record. <laughs> it, 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 and it's it's I don't I she said and so let me tell you first Molly said she doesn't believe in any of that and she loves the love and support and I wouldn't expect a different answer from Molly but you <laughs> seem like such a sh- uh, straight shooter I gotta ask Shannon are we welcome to Alabama game or do we need to it? Do we need to say because um, hey y'all don't lose when I watch on TV so it's just it's an in person thing. Listen, I'm not saying you're not welcome. However, maybe there's an opportunity. You just hang around at the tailgate beforehand. You experience it, then you just go back and watch it at the hotel. See, Randy, what she needs to happen. The reason I'm going to go to the Alabama game is because I'm going to the Tennessee football game the day before, and he's a Tennessee football fan. So what you need to happen that'll work for both y'all is if Tennessee just beats LSU so bad in football, I'll leave town anyway upset. So that's <laughs> that's just – It'll work out for both y'all. It'll work out. I'm I'm all for it, Shannon. I think we're on the same team here. <laughs> so you know, last night, uh, you know, we we talk about the the old Miss game, but I gotta ask you, playing in Starville, the Cowbells, do they do they annoy you? No, I don't really pay too much attention to the crowd. Those those things. Well, when you're sitting in the crowd and you're not one of them, it is it is highly annoying. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know I gotta ask you that that game seemed um you know pretty evenly matched and you know I don't like to make excuses so what I'm just going to ask is is a, a simple question about a certain you know Taylor Doblace being a, a a get guest on this show there was two different calls there were so many questionable calls but there was the one where her feet got taken out from under or where she was going to have a wide open shot on goal and then there was one where her arm got grabbed and she got thrown to the ground and she was going to have a wide open shot and goal Am I wrong from the stands? Were those were those penalties? I have to go back and watch it back, but I mean, if I was a if I was an attacker in that situation, I would definitely sell it. I think sometimes we think as a team, and I tell the girls this, that we get prizes for staying on our feet. And last night it showed up because obviously we got a call against us when the girl chose to go to ground, and I think that's just a technical tactical piece. If if you feel it, go down, sell it. Because if teams are going to do that against us, we can absolutely do that back against them. Um, so maybe I'll I'll practice that with the girls this week at training, get some theatrics going. Yeah, no doubt. So like with that, you know, um, they obviously were scoring off corner kicks, and um, you as a defender, um, and how much y'all y'all practice that? I mean, honestly, with the way last night's game went, like I mean, y'all probably had practice today. I mean, how much was that? You know, talked about just because they were getting them off set pieces like that. Yeah, it was obviously spoke about a lot. It's it's frustrating because in open play, they didn't beat us, but that's just the fine margins of the game. It comes down to the little percentages, and if we're not switched on in those moments, then we're absolutely going to be punished. 
So I think as a team, we just need to stay locked in and we have to stay focused for the whole 90 minutes. We can't afford to, to switch off for those couple of seconds. And I think defensive set pieces are definitely going to be a, a big emphasis this week at training. Yeah, absolutely. So this will be my last thing, and then I'll let uh, I'll let Randy play a game. You know, you know, we talk about the SEC. The 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 West is just a gauntlet. You know, for anybody who pays attention to SEC soccer, you know, you got Ole Miss, Arkansas, and Alabama still on the schedule, among other teams. Um, you know, so like, you know, how excited are you? Like, because you seem like somebody who just loves competition and thrives on competition. Are you excited that you got all these big time opponents coming up? And you know, um, and with that, when you're done, you know. What, best of luck as y'all go forward. Yeah, I'm extremely excited. I would so much rather be the underdog every single weekend and play the top five teams than, than win 5 nil and just expect to win because those are the games we train for. Those are the games that we come out every single day and we sweat and we run and we grind for is to be in those situations to prove ourselves. And I think that's such a beautiful thing about the game is that there's always going to be an underdog. And I love it when it's us because we just have a point to prove. And I know as a team, we can go out there and do that. And that's, again, that belief belief part. If we can go against these teams and believe that we can win and get a result, which we absolutely can, I think that there's going to be some exciting things to watch and some great results this season. Absolutely, Shannon. So, look, you're off the hot seat, and now it's time to play a little game before we get you out of here. And let me let me explain the game. It's It's called this or that. So I'm going to give you two options. You cannot say neither. You can't say both. You got to pick one or the other. You down? Got it. Okay. So we're going to start off with a, a real, a real softball. Is this, is this quick fire? Am I? Just no, 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 no. We'll, we'll expound upon the answers depending on what you say. We'll judge you, but no, no worries. No worries. <laughs> There's judgment. I got to be careful what I say it. Absolutely. There's going to be judgment for sure. Cause if you got All any right. Louisianians listen to this first one, I got to be honest with you. I got to add better food. England or Louisiana? England. I don't even have to think about that one. Oh, okay. I'm, off- I'm offended. I'm offended. Yeah, I ain't been to offended, England, though. But that's it's fine. It's too spicy for me out here. Oh, oh, yeah. What is So if I'm going to go to England, what is one food I have to try? Roast dinner and make sure you get a nice big Yorkshire pudding on it. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'll probably eat whatever. I'm a big guy. I don't, I don't really... <laughs> Okay, so this next one, I got to be, I did not write this next question, so I, I'm going to be. I, that actually came, answer. that actually came from Daniel. That is a, Daniel found that question. Okay, this is, this is from DB, giraffe neck or T-Rex arms? Oh, giraffe neck. Okay, explain <laughs> that to me. Anybody, any, everybody? <laughs> I would be extremely dangerous in the box if I could just stand on the edge of the 18 and move my head. <laughs> understood every time yeah i don't think there's really an advantage to t-rex arms at all right um, i can't think of one yeah i think it's more about the fact that if you're willing to stand out with the giraffe neck or would you rather just have the little arms but shannon found the positive side of she it so. did. all right so the next question talking movies now comedy or drama probably gonna go for comedy all right. What is your favorite comedy movie of all time? Of all time. Anything Adam Sandler. I just absolutely love him. That hey, not a bad pick at all. He's great. All right. So you, you talked about you talked about both of these things. You talked about the boogie board. You talked about Vegas. So I gotta ask you, you get an option. The beach or the casino. Which one are you doing? Oh, that's a great question. I think I'm gonna go with beach because I saved my money. This is true. You got a free boogie board. <laughs> right? What a bargain. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. You could go to a concert or a sporting event. Any concert, any sporting event. Which one are you picking? Oh, that's a great question as well. I'm probably going to pick sporting event. All right. So what is it? Is it World Cup? I mean, what are we saying? What sporting event would you say you have to go to? I would have loved to have been there for the Euros when the women, England women, just won a couple of months ago. I'd have, if I was back home, I absolutely would have found a way to get a ticket. I love it. I love it. All right. Would you rather be a hero or a villain? <laughs> Is that a trick question? No, no. 
This is this is real deal, Holyfield. And, this and is when the judgment starts. And, and I know you probably think that it's just everybody says hero. No, no, no. It's way more people it, pick villain. Yeah. I think may, maybe not way, but more people pick villain than hero, in my opinion. Um, I, I have mean, no other way reasons why I'd want to be a villain, but yeah, I'd love to be a hero. Okay, well, who's your favorite hero? Like a superhero? Of course. Are there any other heroes? Yeah, my family are quite heroic to me, but that's a bit. Of a oh, that's true. Story. That's a great answer. <laughs> mom, dad, you heard it. Shout out to mom and dad. Absolutely. Sorry. Superhero, though. Favorite one. Um, Spider-Man, because I'm not really a Marvel girl, but I have seen the Spider-Mans and I think they're pretty cool. My, my four year old would absolutely agree with you. <laughs> absolutely. All right. Last one. This is the one I will judge you on. Would you rather have massive success on accident or modest success on purpose? That is a good question. Did you it Google is. that one? Rephrase no. it. Rephrase All it. All right. Andy. So let me let me tell it to you this way. If I was to say, Shannon, I'm going to give you a hundred million dollars or you can earn $20 million. Which one would you take? I would want you to give me a hundred mil. <laughs> you were the smartest person we've ever had on this podcast. Actually, you know what? That's maybe two in a row to pick that. No, but most people, Before that, it was the other. Most people always say, well, I want to earn my 20 million. And then I'm like, but now I got 80 more million dollars than you just yeah. because you wanted to earn it. Especially because we're talking to athletes, Shannon. So they'll be like, oh, I want, you know, like I want to make my $20 million playing baseball, football, soccer, whatever. No, They're just give showing me up the, the hundred. Camera. You've got to be real with these things. You um, gotta be give real. Give me that hundred mil. Where do I sign? Then I'm gonna go and earn another twenty mil. And now I'm at one twenty. Exactly. And just don't go to the casino, Shannon. Oh, yeah. I'll slap it all on black. <laughs> <laughs> I can last oh, a, at least thirty oh, minutes black. with twenty five dollars a hand. <laughs> and hey, you I know what? A long time in Vegas. Based upon her answer right there, or that comment right there, I think she actually still would have took the casino or the beach if you would have told her that she had uh, fun, you know, you were uh, actually giving her the money to play with, Randy. Big facts. That's the biggest, that was the best part of the question. If I feel like being giving me the money, I'd be there. I'd be there right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Shannon, before you get out of here, anything you want to plug or promote? Plug or promote? Come to our game against Kentucky. This Sunday at home, we want the biggest crowd that we've ever had. We're looking to beat 3,021. So if you could be the 3,022, there might be a special gift waiting for you in the stands. Oh. <laughs> it's a boogie board straight out the trash. <laughs> in 2022, you can be fan number 3,022, and they got something special for you. Got a ring to it. There you go. If you want to know more about Shannon Cook, go on over to Instagram at Shan with two N's underscore Cook with a K with an E or see what she's doing on the soccer field at LSU Soccer. Shannon, had a great time. Thank you for joining us. If there's anything that we can do for you along the way, please reach out to us. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me on. Absolutely. That's Shannon Cook, everybody. We are going to take a break. We're going to plug our sponsors. When we come back, we got all things Pujols, Judge, college football, and pro football.